Hey, I'm Rui. I'm here to basically explain, since one of the hardest part is run uh, API aggregator at scale, uh, we have, we are doing so at Zalando. And one of the problems we had was performance. And this is one way that we improved our operations. So who am I? My name is Rui. I'm engineering lead in an infrastructure team at Zalando. Uh, Zalando is the online fashion company in Europe. Um, and it's a, now powered by GraphQL uh, whenever you're using our platform, uh, most of the cases. Um, OK, so let's talk how GraphQL at Zalando works. Uh, we are big fans of micro front -end. Uh This, If you're in the front-end community, you have heard uh, <laughs> a bit of rants about this approach. But we are proud of it. And uh, I, we think we know how to do it at scale. Um, we have basically now a new internal framework uh, that has GraphQL at its core. Uh, it's this Fashion Store API. Fashion Store is how we call our store. And uh, this is basically an API gateway. GraphQL, very thin. We focus basically on aggregation logic. And the Fashion Store data, think 50 microservices, OK? Maybe more, but we'll get there. And um, we have kind of a unique way of how you use GraphQL. Instead of one big query, our clients send us a lot of tiny ones. OK, so think you're, you're doing the, pro the catalog. Each product will be a different query. OK, and they send us in a bulk request. And due to some reasons internally, we base it on Node.js in TypeScript. And uh, now you might be thinking performance, Node.js. Um, you can still get what you need from Node.js if you know very well how to use your runtime. Any runtime, you can make it performance if you know it well enough. So let's go. And basically, we built this a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, we ship it. We, we did some tests. We already knew it was going to be problematic. Uh, we were using GraphQL.js, and um, it was problematic. Uh, this kind of uh, bulk request mode uh, it really burned out any memoization technique that GraphQL.js had. Uh, there was a couple of places, and it just was always busting that cache. Another thing is that if you're doing 100 queries, if you have a little bit of overhead, let's say one millisecond of overhead, you do 100 queries, you're going to have 100 second, milliseconds of overhead. Um, at Zalando, we live and die by the milliseconds, right? E commerce. People don't shop if it takes too much. And another thing that also really bothered us was um, our consumers, they don't really care about GraphQL. This is for developers, right? So we found it very hard to even justify using it. And we had really a lot of internal opposition because this is too complex, right? You cannot accelerate this, too dynamic, give up, go back to rest. <laughs> um, and we said, no, we think we can make it work. So let's look at a query. Queries, so GraphQL is dynamic, right? So in my opinion, GraphQL is not dynamic. GraphQL, the dynamicism comes from the dev time properties that you have, right? You can specify basically a lot of different queries, but the query itself, it's super static, right? What do we have? We have at least, we can have some inputs. Yes, there's skip and include, which can operate a little bit like ifs. There's proposals for fragments to operate more like simple transformation functions with their own scope. But it's not Turing complete. Please keep it not Turing complete. <laughs> and uh, this also means that we can reason at it on, on static time, right? We, we know that the user, what the user wants from this. And our consumers, our developers, we started to think more about GraphQL only as a dev time tool, really. So we started defining our own product as this is a backend as a service, uh, instantiate the response you want out of the schema. And the schema is basically a library that our front end um, uh, users can, can play with. And another thing that we also notice is in the way we, we even write our code. So this is basically, so we have this two, and let's imagine this, this particular use case. We would have this kind of structure. We, we use a Graph, GraphQL tools, and we noticed that we, we would have um, basically rely on the implicit resolver a lot of times. 
right? So we, we would have, okay, let's resolve the product. We get the fields of the product, and 80% of the fields come in the product model. And then, okay, there's another operation, and this one has a, a new resolver. Um, so if this is the case, we don't really need to do a lot of work. Imagine that you're doing this manually, right? There's no GraphQL, and I'm asking you, build me this, this endpoint. What do you do? You go in, you write get product, and you deconstruct, you construct your product model, return, serialization, all done, right? Why should it be different? It should be like this. So then we decided, OK, no more GraphQL in production. Everyone will persist their queries, and we're going to compile them all. <laughs> so how did we compile them? Looks Kind of weird. You're not supposed to read this. It doesn't really matter what it says. But it, this is a tiny query and gets this big. It actually gets much bigger because GraphQL has like quite interesting error handling properties. And in order to make it safe, the generated code is like 95% error handling. <laughs> but let's go a little deeper. How does this look? So it, we try to basically reason. Uh, the same way that you would write it, right? So we have a resolver. We use these resolvers, basically, as markers for re execution, right? So basically, we, uh, when we are designing our own implementation, we force um, people to mark, use resolvers as places where we know that we're going to need the field execution. Then we have this, basically, a wrapper function, which is basically a scheduler for promises or not promises. It's doing this, this kind of scheduling. And it constructs the, the, um, the output model in real time. Now, notice that display price had a, a resolver, right? So it had its own resolver. So we do, we do immediately, we set display price to null. And this helps us really with uh, the runtime that we are on, right? We are on Node.js. Node.js uses internally V8. V8 is a wonderful engine. If you help him be a wonderful engine, <laughs> it. So to be a, a wonderful engine, he, V8 really likes to know what he's working with. So he li likes to know the shape, basically. And providing this, this kind of properties immediately, like this is the shape you're going to work with, really allows V8 to generate really optimized code. And we notice major difference. And basically, so we, we do this, we set up the product, and on the next go, we execute then the display price resolver. This is almost real compilation code. Um, it's not the, it doesn't have the error handling. And then we call the string serializer, which ensures the, the properties of coercion and serialization of the spec. It does validation. and. More, more error handling. Uh, we have a little demo that we can, can run. Um, this demo basically uh, allows one to play with it. So you can go to this website, put a schema, put a query, put a resolver. You press execute. And this is actual compiled code. And now if you see, this is why we had to edit it for the slide. It's kind of madness, because we are inlining everything. <laughs> There's nothing that's running in runtime. Everything has been pre-calculated. -pre Locations, messages. What we can do ahead of time, we do ahead of time. <laughs> um, yeah, so play around and give feedback also in the repo. So back to the presentation. What are the results of this thing? Um, this is very synthetic, but they have been quite good. So at Zalando, this basically removed, we stopped seeing overhead uh, due to GraphQL, and we were competing. When we introduced this product, we came from a very autonomous development style, and uh, people had their own aggregators that had been custom built for their use cases, right? And this is what we were competing against. And the rule was, you have to be as good as that, right? And this allowed us to get there, really. So, um, of course, this has tricks that we can use. So, for example, we have the compiler, and this allows us very easily to play with the serialization mechanisms that the compiler uses, to skip it in optional cases. So for example, if you have an API gateway in front 
of uh, gRPC where you have very uh, static types and you know that there's no quotient needed. Uh, with a compiler, we can skip this optionally, for example. And these are some of the tricks that we use to get this kind of numbers. And I have basically another latency profile. This is also a synthetic test. Um, you should not believe me on all of these numbers, please. Please profile your own applications. Um, this is not magic. This is just a different approach. And uh, the best thing is we made it available. So it's open source. This is, has now become a sponsored product. Uh, by Zalando in terms of development time, so the team I lead works on it, and we'll keep working on it. Uh, we actually discussed with the maintainers of GraphQL.js whether it makes sense to merge or not uh, as optional, but for now it's going to stay, stay separate uh, and give us opportunities of thinking on uh, this kind of compile-first approach. Uh, it's not yet spec compliant. We are missing one little bit, which is keep and include proper support. Uh, we're actually, I'm actually working on it, and together with a, with a colleague, um, we are taking the opportunity to refactor a little bit of the compiler, but it should be coming soon. And after this, um, we're pretty happy. So the plan is basically to allow more hooks for building in more uh, ahead of time compilations of enrichments. We already do this at Aslando. So for example, um, you have this kind of field filtering options that you build based on um, the top level, but we actually have a lot of look-ahead scenarios that we need to do because we model some tree structured and it's helpful for our backend that we're going to hit to know the depth, for example. And so all these look-aheads, we do it all in compile time. This is static information. And uh, we don't have really have a nice API yet for this. We are iterating on it. This is what we're bringing to the table. And um, yeah, that's about it. In other platforms, I actually believe this approach could even be more explosive. I've seen someone do something very similar in Go. It's not completely what we do, but it's very close. I also believe that in JVM-based approach, where we actually have types, you could go crazy and avoid uh, intermediate object allocation that we still have to do uh, because we're not that far ahead yet. And um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. And now